Thank you so much, Christopher. So closing the case for the opposition tonight, and the last of our paper speakers, is Baroness Heyman. Baroness Heyman is a crossbench peer who is the current chair for Peers for Punnett, and he previously served as the first ever Lord Speaker from 2006 to 2011. Having entered the House of Lords in 1996, she has also held ministerial posts in the Transport, Agriculture, Fisheries and Food and Health Departments. She is also a former president of our society, having sat exactly in this chair 55 years ago in Easter 1969. Baroness right. Heyman, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. But you really didn't have to go into the numbers in quite that way. <laughs> but it is 55 years ago, uh, and it's lovely to see a woman sitting in that seat. Women had only recently been admitted to this august chamber uh, when I came up in 1966. Um, slightly later than women were allowed into the House of Lords, actually. Um, but it is a pleasure to be here, and as you say, I've, I've had the opportunity of doing some wonderful things since, and being in some wonderful situations. Um, and, you know, despite all this stuff about how posh everyone is in the House of Lords, I'm a grammar school girl from Wolverhampton, um, Jenny Jones has just told you her background. Um, so this is not to the manner born for the majority of people who are in the House of Lords. But one day I, I was actually dropping names at Buckingham Palace. It was a state visit, it was a state banquet. And I turned to my husband and I said, sweetheart, do you ever in your wildest dreams think that I would end up here? And he said, I'm sorry, sweetheart, but in my wildest dreams, you don't feature at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. That's my husband. OK. <laughs> we are in danger of violently agreeing yes. in this chamber tonight. You'll not find the three of us saying that everything is perfect in the House of Lords. You'll not say, find us saying that we don't want to see reform. You'll not see us, say us, hear us saying that we're not trying to get that reform. It's all very well shouting at us for, you can't reform yourselves. To an extent, we can. Um, my private member's bill, little thing, but it got through uh, Phillips. Uh, proposals, but the government has to reform the House of Lords if it wants to. We've voted, we've said we want to be smaller than the House of Commons. Uh, we've said that we want a statutory appointments commission. Uh, many of us would go much further on many things, but you've got to have, may I say it, an elected government that has this as its proposal. And that doesn't happen. So my vision of a House of Lords that didn't bring titles with it, where you sat as a working parliamentarian, that was a smaller house, uh, that had an appointments commission that looked at proposals from the political parties with the same degree of scrutiny about their suitability as they do for crossbench peers, my view about how we would actually function um, and how we would be divorced from the honours system, uh, how we would have time limits so life didn't mean life in the House of Lords, that's a vision that I suspect we could probably get a majority for here tonight. The problem is that I haven't heard an argument for unicameralism expressed this evening. Most advanced democracies understand that some form of check and balance is useful. 
first chambers, lower chambers, they're rather like Tolstoy's happy families. They're all the same. They're representation by population. You have constituencies that are the same size, people's votes count in the same way. Second chambers are like unhappy families. They're all different. Men, and they tend to be the product of history or of geography. So in federal countries, it's much easier to see how you have a second chamber that is in some way democratically accountable because it represents the bits of the federation. More difficult in countries like France and the UK where we are coming up out of history. And it's quite true, the gentleman over there who said this is a bit of the UK's history it absolutely is. But I'm afraid you can't sit in this chamber. Uh, I mean, I find it a bit strange, actually, that people sitting here say, don't you understand, in the House of Lords, you're completely out of touch with normal <laughs> British life. We may have to put on our robes once a year. We don't put on dinner jackets every time we speak in the House of Lords, you know. So, so I, I'm not going to be completely uh, intimidated by this sort of vision. But also, you can't have it both ways. When you shout at the House of Lords for not blocking the Rwanda bill completely, and you shout at us because we have no democratic accountability and we haven't been elected by anyone. So what would give us the right to block the Rwanda bill completely? You say we don't do anything. Actually, through all that process, at the end, there will be Afghan refugees yes. who are not deported to Rwanda because of the work that was done in the House of Lords. Yes. What we do, and Philip Norton talked about it. Point. Sure. I only do so because she interrupted me on yes, a point yes. of fact, and I wonder if she would like to uh, revisit what she's just said, because as I understand it, the actual text amendment was rejected in the House of Lords, and the concession was given on the guidance, which is unenforceable. So that's a bit of a, a reach with regards to Afghanistan. Well, <laughs> absolutely, it was a dispatch box commitment. It was not the amendment to the House of Lords. It, sure. Has anyone in the Tory government ever given us, you know, any sort of leave to trust what they say or commitments they make? Yeah. I'm not here to defend the Tory government. I am here to, I promise you that, I am here to say that if you study Parliament, if you study commitments that are made at the dispatch, bo dispatch box by ministers, they are implemented. Yeah. And sometimes you do it by that than rather by the actual bit of the legislation. I do not believe that that promise will not be fulfilled. But can I just say that we do make a difference who said no, no different, don't do anything? There's a thousand amendments every year that actually happen in the House of Lords. But they're those detailed amendments because we don't have the democratic <laughs> accountability or legitimacy to turn around to the House of Commons and say, I don't care that you were elected on a manifesto that said you'd do this. We think it's wrong, so you can't do it. We know our place. If you replace the House of Lords by an elected chamber, why do you think that elected chamber will be different in its views from the elected chamber that you don't like what they're doing already? This doesn't make sense. You, of course. The, the French... Australian, American yeah. system of upper houses, they often disagree very strongly. It is yeah. possible to have a democratic chamber which is still a bit more judicial. And, and it is possible to. Um, as I said before, it's much easier uh, in federations 
and in countries that have very different geographical um, entities rather than being for nations in the way that we are. And also, they get into terrible gridlock sometimes. Look at the Italians who have two chambers elected on the same basis. If you elect two chambers on a different basis, then one is first past the post, one is proportional reputation, uh, representation. Whose, elect, whose mandate is better than anyone else's mandate? The House of Lords is far from perfect. Why it has never been reformed totally or abolished or replaced totally is that once you get into the nitty gritty of what you replace it with, it's very hard to find a formula that is better than what we've got at the moment. By all means, clear the stables, clean the stables. I'm not defending everything that's gone on, particularly in recent prime ministers, but there's ways through this. We can do it better, and we can have a revising chamber that we can be proud of. much Baroness Heyman for that speech and with that our debate tonight concludes so a couple of notices from me um, before we go to vote so firstly is that next week we'll be having former Tiananmen Square protest leader Sao Feng Su speaking at the Union on Monday at 7 p.m um, and then on Wednesday we'll have Brit former British number one tennis player Joanna Conta speaking as well so please do come along to those speaker events Secondly, much like what has been discussed today, um, the Cambridge Union is also doing reform. So if you look on your order papers tonight, you'll see a QR code. That QR code is to a membership survey that you'll all be able to fill out with feedback for committee on things that you think we could reform. Um, so please do fill it out if you would also like to see the Cambridge Union do reform. Um, so could the tellers now please take position? So in this house, we vote with our feet, the eyes to the right and the nose to the left and abstentions right down the middle. The results will be announced in the bar afterwards where we'll also have some free chirps um, and special debate night deals. So do join us to continue the debate in the bar. Could we please end with one last round of applause for all those who contributed this evening.